Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum, and today we're moving on with Allied aircraft that were significant in World War II. And obviously, my allergic assistant today has picked out something because we have moved on to the French, Greg. And of course, the French, you can see the Statue of Liberty. Who gave us the Statue of Liberty? The French. So, and today he's also, I mean, I may actually have a drink I can consume today, but we have covered everything with France today, Greg. This is really themed. You are, you're on your game. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this thing off here and toss it off camera. Oh my goodness. In a hundred, nearly a hundred episodes, we have a drop by the Kenny. We have a drop. Greg, the playoffs are coming. You cannot drop something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm distraught. He even broke my train of thought here. But we're doing the uh, Diotine, the D520. The, the interesting thing about this fighter and what went on with the French is the French, like the British and everybody else in the region, either whether you were Axis or Allies, they were all rearming. And the 520 actually traces its roots back to the early 30s with its designer, Robert Costello. And uh, he, uh, they, they were actually working on this fighter for quite a bit of time, and then they got distracted. They didn't come back to it until um, uh, late, like 1935, 1936. But I'm going to go ahead and throw up a, a plan view of the airplane. It's, to me, Greg, it looks a little stubby. It almost looks like that MiG, you know, we were talking about the MiGs, these kind of really compact fighters built around that uh, V-12 liquid-cooled engine. This aircraft was really built around a 20 millimeter cannon. It had machine guns, it had four machine guns, but it was really built around that 20 millimeter cannon, and it was built to augment the MS-406, was, which was the most numerous fighter that the French had in inventory at the time. As I said, it first flew in 1938. It was introduced in 1940. And because of the weird thing with the French, this airplane actually made it all the way out, you know, with the Vichy French and the Free French and everybody else. This aircraft actually made it all the way out to 1953. It flew a trainer. So this is another uh, aircraft from World War II that actually had a long life. Now, when it got into combat, when we moved out of the phony war and we moved into the shooting war with the, um, with the Germans, there were about 900 of these in inventory built across the build schedule. They weren't in really a lot of numbers to impact the, uh, the German invasion when the, when the fighting actually went into France. But there are a couple of things about the airplane that were interesting. Um, it could actually outmaneuver an ME-109. Which, but it wasn't as fast. So it, it, and it had, the thing about it was, it was a little squirrely uh, when you get into, uh, got into combat with it. I'm going to tell you why. The, uh, the design came from the D510, which by the way, by the time the 510 went into service, it was already obsolete. So we talked about this rush into these low wing fighters and it was just bang, 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 bang. Like that, Greg, that was, you put some sound effects in there. Uh, because what was happening was as they were breaking through these barriers on the aerodynamics and the power plants, these aircraft were becoming obsolete really quickly. Um, comparable aircraft that were in design at the time, but that did not make it into production, the MS-450, the C-770, and the CAO 200. Greg, you're going to have fun finding those. The concurrent designs that flew were the MB. Now, this is interesting, Greg. I've never seen this in marking airplanes. The MB, the 152.01 for a designation on an airplane, which is kind of interesting. And the VG 33 actually flew. They were um, concurrent designs as the French were working on, but they didn't fly in enough numbers to impact the war. So what ended up happening was the aircraft fought the, uh, pretty well, uh, but the French got knocked out of the war. And then you had this interesting 
situation. Well, they got knocked out of the war on the Allied side. And then you had the, this interesting situation where you had the Free French fighting with the Allies and the Vichy French fighting in North Africa and in France. The Allies ran into this airplane uh, on both sides. RAF, a Captain Eric Brown flew the airplane and he called it, Greg, a nasty little brute, which is, a, I guess, grudging praise from, a, um, from a, an RAF uh, flight officer. Now, what were the problems with it? Well, basically, uh, we talked about center of gravity in some airplanes, and that is, uh, that can change with a couple of things. It can change if you're, like if you're in a cargo airplane and the cargo moves around inside the airplane when you're taking off, the cargo moves, that can pretty much lose the airplane. Uh, you can have center of gravity changes if you're firing the guns and the weight changes because of the ammunition. That's another way you expend it. If you have a lot of ammunition or bomb load is another reason. But the other thing that you had to be super, super careful of in a lot, well, not in a lot, in all fighters or anything that you're playing, you're flying is what, Greg? Gas, fuel, because what does gas do? Gas does a couple of things. One, it's a liquid. So it moves around in the fuel tank, so theoretically it can cause you problems. The other thing, as you consume it, if you don't consume it in the right way across the airplane or manage the way your fuel is in the airframe, what ends up happening? It throws off your center of gravity. And that's what Eric was running into. He would say the airplane, you could be taxing the airplane and depending on where the fuel was or whatever with the airplane, the airplane would essentially just go off the runway for no particular reason. The other problem that it had was the way the wing design was, was designed, the, uh, the ME-109 had a, a slatted wing, it had slots in the wing. And the, what that would mean was that it had, as the airflow changed, as the airplane slowed down over the wing, um, it could, could, can still be maneuverable. This aircraft did not have that. So what happened? That would be very dangerous. An ME-109 could turn in, in a, what's called a ragged edge of a stall. In other words, the airplane is slowing down, the airflow over the wing is getting, um, is getting lower, and if the, airplane, if the airplane loses lift, if the wing loses lift, depending where it, where it loses lift, it'll just it'll basically go out of control. It'll spin until you get enough speed, enough airflow over the wing, and the control services to recover. We've talked about this a million times. We're not gonna talk about it too much more, but this airplane had very serious problems with that to the point where they would caution French pilots if you were with an ME-109 and, and, the, and a 109 pilot was smart enough to know the airplane that he was up against, know your equipment. If you could get that uh, 520 pilot into the right flight envelope, remember when we talked about the, uh, the zeros uh, would do that with uh, wildcat pilots where they, zero would go into a zoom climb and what they would do is they would sucker that wildcat pilot into a climbing fight with them. The wildcat would stall, the zero would come up over the top, the wildcat's out of control, he'd make the kill. With this airplane, it was in turns. The 109 pilot, if he knew what he was up against and he could get it into a slow turning fight, he knew that although this airplane could outturn him at speed, when you slowed down, the airplane stalled, spun out of control. If, if, you're at the right, if you're at the wrong altitude, what is that, Greg? We've talked about it before. That's a bad day. Because there's no ejection seat in this airplane. If you're at low altitude, you're basically riding the airplane and you're not going to get out of it. And, and so the Germans learned real quickly with this airplane, getting a low speed fight with him, and, and try to get him into a turning fight. If you could do that, there was a good chance that, the, that this 520 would not be able to stay with you. Now, what I wanna do today is I want to talk about the French aviators. French aviation and French inventors at the, at the outset of flight and all the way up to, the, there's not enough said about the, the French. The French uh, have not only been on the cutting edge of design uh, in, in aircraft from the very outset of flight all the way through to World War II and beyond, 
and we just don't do uh, enough of a salute, especially uh, French military aviation. The Mirage, the Mirage 2000 in modern history, one of the best airplanes uh, fighters ever made. It's an amazing fighter. And uh, the, the French continue to turn out amazing aircraft. So what I want to do today with my Lorena, my artisanal sparkling blood orange soda. This one, Greg, this is French, by the way. There's even a little French flag there. Um, I may be able to actually drink this one, Greg, as opposed to the last five you've given me, which have been uh, been disgusting. But the um, the uh, this has 110 calories. Now, the French are not big pure cane sugar marketers, so I'm sure there's sugar in this. Um, 27 grams of sugar, 54, I think 54% of your daily intake. You know how they have that on there? All right, we got the fizz. It's cold too. Oh, Greg, my palate is, is quivering in anticipation of this one, I think. This might actually be a good one. This was, uh, these folks go all the way back to 1895 that bottled this. Let's give it a shot. You know, the expectation was there, blood orange soda. I thought it was uh, going to be like a total home run. It is not terrible. Now, it could be, again, it's gone, it got hot, and it's just not sweet. Mm. You know, so I took a little more that time because I figured this one, actually, you might not give me botulism with this one. Um, it's, it's not too sweet. It's not terrible, though. So I, it, it's not the, the uh, swill that you're normally throwing at me. Oh, ho, ho, Greg. So the, um, so the airplane, uh, this aircraft went on. It, there were 153 of them that flew in North Africa. So they flew in, in pretty good numbers. But uh, by 1943, the airplane was, what was it considered? Obsolete. It was obsolete. It was flying at that time against P-40s, Hurricanes. These are all comparable aircraft. The Spitfire, the Yak-1, and the MiG-3. So the aircraft uh, fought on it. Now, to be clear, Greg, it fought on both sides of the conflict. Both sides had it. But uh, by 1943, the airplane, as I said, was considered obsolete. It was pretty much done, which happened with a lot of these fighters. Think about a P-40 which we talked about in 1943, that pretty much obsolete, even though they kept upgrading them. So, uh, but the interesting thing about this nasty little brute was that it continued to fly as a trainer all the way out until 1953. It joins that club of unusual airplanes that soldiered on after World War II and the mass exodus of airplanes as uh, air forces around the world stood down. The Axis Air Forces were obviously destroyed, and they weren't flying pretty much anything after the armistice and the uh, the surrender. And the uh, the Allies were just headlong rush into jets. But these continue to soldier on. Now you would think with that that there would be a lot in museums. I could only find three in France, which is very interesting. And I didn't find. I'm not really clear if there are any of them that are flying, which would also be kind of kind of interesting. There may be one flying in France, but anyways, it was a very unique, interesting uh, aircraft, and had the French not been knocked out of the war, probably this would have been one of the most predominant fighters in their inventory. Now, guess what, Craig? If you want to, at the leisure of your time in your home, if you wanted to actually color one of these. Look at this, Greg. You could actually color it. Greg is, we're, as I've said many times, we're improving his coloring skills. He's getting very, very good. Maybe you could make that look at like that, and I'll actually, you know, put it on my wall, Greg. You, you could do that. So uh, go ahead and click on that link if you'd like this wonderful coloring book, and Jason will send it out to you for one of your aviation friends. Now you see behind me, we've got a P-51 torn down. That's Bunny. We cannot do this kind of restoration work or keep these airplanes flying without your donation. So click on that link 
uh, that's also included in the video. If you have come across us on YouTube and you like what you see, give us a subscription and give the gift of Warbird Wednesday. We can always, always use new subscribers. We love having you here. Give us comments down in the comment section. We will respond back to you. We appreciate your time so much. Like us on Facebook. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.